Every parent knows what it's like to be bombarded with questions from your children. Now, when your children are small, the questions are sincere questions. Questions like, why is the sky blue? Where did God come from? Or why is daddy always in a bad mood? I mean, we get those questions when our children are small. But have you noticed the older they get, those questions move from being sincere questions to sometimes questions that challenge our authority. Why can't I stay out an extra hour? Why can't I have my own car? You know, as a parent, we respond one way to sincere questions, but we respond completely differently to questions meant to challenge our authority. We shouldn't be surprised that God's the same way. God never resents sincere questions. Uh, he doesn't always answer the questions. Remember Job asked him in the midst of his suffering the why question? God basically said, uh, it's beyond your pay grade to understand. I, you couldn't begin to understand the why question even if I explained it to you. Or the disciples, they were asking Jesus before he ascended back into heaven, uh, Lord, is it at this time? When are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus politely but firmly said, it's none of your business. That's God the Father's business. But God is not threatened by sincere questions. However, when people ask questions that are meant to mask their own rebellion and unbelief, God responds differently. And we see that illustrated in how Jesus responded to three questions that were asked not sincerely, but were meant to discredit and ultimately destroy him. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 19 as we discover how Jesus responded when he found himself in the hot seat. Look at Luke 19, 47 to 48. And Jesus was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. They were infuriated at Jesus. And so they could not find anything that they might do for all the people were hanging upon his words. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. And they knew the only way to do that was to either catch him in blasphemy or in treason against Rome. And now between the white space in your Bible, between the end of chapter 19 and the beginning of chapter 20, they came up with a plan. You see, they couldn't openly kill him at this point because he was too popular. So how in the world were they going to catch Jesus? Well, they came up with this plan. And the plan was they would try to trick Jesus into committing either blasphemy or treason by answer, asking him three tough questions. Questions about his identity, about the role of government, and about the nature of eternity. Let's look at the first question, the question of Jesus' identity, beginning with chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And it came about on one of the days while Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him. And they spoke, saying to him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is the one who gave you this authority? What things? They were saying, who gave you the authority to do what you did yesterday? In cleaning out this temple, turning over the tables of the money changers. Who gave you the authority to do what you did in our holy temple? Well, Jesus decided to answer their question with another question. Look at verses 3 and 4. And he answered and said to them, I shall also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Why did he ask about John the Baptist? John the Baptist, remember, was a revered prophet. The people loved John the Baptist. And remember, John the Baptist was the one who came to announce the coming of Christ. When he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who is to take away the sins of the world. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation of this entire universe. And you either submit to him or you will be broken over him. You know, the apostle Peter understood that. There are some faith traditions today that say that the apostle Peter is the cornerstone of the church, the foundation of the church. No, he's not. Even Peter did not believe he was the cornerstone of the church. Peter said Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. 
Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. For this is contained in Scripture, and he quotes from Isaiah 28, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, and then he quotes from Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. And then he quotes from Isaiah 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed Although Jesus is the cornerstone of God's plan for the world, have you noticed how people stumble over Jesus Christ? They wanted to kill him right then, but they had a problem. He was too popular. So they decided to try to trip him up with a second question, a question that is sure to cause controversy back then just as it is today. They decided to question him about the subject of politics. <laughs> The politics of his day. And that's what they did. Look at verses 21 and 22. The question about government's authority. And so, a second group came to him of Jews. And they questioned him saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly. And you're not partial to any. But teach the way of God in truth. Pardon me if I barf right here. They are so insincere. You just see the insincerity, the honey drip. Oh, Lord, we just believe everything you have to say. So please answer this simple question for us. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Is it lawful for a Jew to pay taxes to the corrupt Roman government? Now, Matthew and Mark's account Tell us which group of Jews were coming to ask this question. It was the Pharisees and the Herodians. And why that's interesting is because those two groups of Jews hated one another. They absolutely hated one another because they had polar opposite views of what the right response to government was. Uh, the Pharisees believed you ought to resist the Roman government at every chance you have. The Roman government is corrupt, and it's an abomination that foreigners would have rule over Israel. So they said, resist the government. The Herodians were that sect of the Jews that said, let's go along to get along. Let's try to make peace with the Romans as much, we, as, much as we can. Let's pay our taxes and do what we can uh, to live under their rule. But these two groups, even though they hated one another, they had a common enemy, Jesus Christ. And so they come together and they say, now, Lord, tell us about this tax thing. Is it rightful to pay taxes or not? Here's why it was a trick question. If Jesus said, yes, it's right to pay taxes, then the group of Jews who hated Rome would say, he can't be the Messiah. If he's for supporting Rome, if he said, no, you need to be conscientious objectors and not pay your taxes, then he would have been guilty of treason and would have been prematurely killed by the Romans. So how did he answer this question? Look at verse 24. Jesus said, show me a denarius. Bring me a denarius, a coin, the basic unit of currency then. The denarius was about one day's wage. On the denarius, there was an inscription it said, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Tiberius was the emperor of Rome. He was the son of Augustus, whom the Romans thought was divine. So he said, bring me this denarius. Now, the denarius represented the, the poll tax that the Jews paid once a year. They paid other taxes, but this was the poll tax to support the Roman government, and it was one denarius. That's what it was, the tax that was due, one denarius. So Jesus said, now, give me one of those coins, and he held it up. What did he do with the coin? Did he throw it away and say, this is a pagan image on here, you shouldn't have anything to do with it? No. As he held it up, he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. That word render means pay to. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and render to God what is God's. The Sanhedrin couldn't trip him up on the question about his identity. 
Uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians couldn't trip him up on questions about government. So there was one final group to come to Jesus to question him about eternity. And this final group, the Bible tells us, was a group known as the Sadducees. And so the Sadducees, who didn't believe in any resurrection at all, posed this question to Jesus. Look at verse 29. Jesus, um, there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife, and he died childless. So according to the law, the second took the wife. Apparently, he died childless. And then the third took her, and in the same way, all seven husbands died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died also. Probably out of exhaustion. We don't know. But finally, the woman died also. <laughs> now, here's the question. In the resurrection, which we don't believe in, in the resurrection, Jesus, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had her as their wife. Now, there's a legitimate question in there somewhere. Perhaps you've wondered the same thing. Maybe you've lost your husband or wife. Maybe you've remarried. That's acceptable. That's good. Romans 7 verse 2 says you are free to marry if your mate has died. It's not good for a man or a woman to be alone. That's fine. But maybe in the back of your mind, you've wondered, okay, if I have two or three natural husbands or wives, when we get to heaven... You know, do I convert to Mormonism or do I have to decide which one is going to be my legitimate mate? Which one? That's a good legitimate question. Notice how Jesus responds to that question, which was an insincere question. Jesus said to them, verse 34, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for neither can they die anymore, for they are like angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. He said, there's no marriage in heaven. There's no procreation in heaven. We become like the angels. Notice he doesn't say we become angels. Don't listen to the Hollywood movies or the TV shows that say, you know, we get our wings when we go to No, you don't get any wings when you go to heaven. Only angels have wings. Here's the way we are like angels, though. We don't die in heaven. And therefore, because no believer dies, there's no need for this procreation to continue the line of faith. There's no death, and so there's no need for marriage in heaven. But then notice what he says in verse 37. He says, and by the way, about this resurrection that you say you don't believe in, the fact that the dead are raised, Jesus says, even Moses believed in that. In the passage about the burning bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, now he is not the God of the dead but of the living, for all live to him. You know what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees? He said, you don't believe in the resurrection? Even in the first five books of the Old Testament, the ones you say you believe, you find the resurrection. They probably said, well, where is the resurrection? In the Torah, in the first five books. And Jesus quotes the chapter and verse. He said, it's in the passage, Exodus 3, verse 6, when Moses, the guy you all revere, Sadducees, when Moses appeared before God, and God was in the form of the burning bush. Remember Moses asked, who are you? And God identified himself as the great, what? I am. And he said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at that point had been dead for hundreds of years. If there were no resurrection, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were just gone and cease to exist, then what God should have said was, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the fact that God uses the present tense, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is proof that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive. They were in heaven with God. Isn't it interesting that Jesus based the whole doctrine of the resurrection on the tense of one verb in the Bible? By the way, did you know Jesus believed every word of this book is inspired of God? It's not just the ideas. It's not just the thoughts. 
It's not even just the words. It is the tense of the words that is all God breathed. Make no mistake about it. If you're a follower of Christ, you're going to be in the hot seat at some point. You're going to face severe challenges and questionings about your faith. In fact, Jesus predicted that in Luke 21, verses 12 and 13. But before all these things, talking about the end times, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. I believe there's a day coming even in America where this is going to be true. When Christians are going to be brought before the court system to give an answer for what they believe. And when that time comes, how should you respond? Well, I think Jesus gives us a great model for how to do that. First of all, when you find yourself under severe questioning, first of all, be mindful. Be mindful. Be mindful of the other people who are listening to how you answer. It's not just the interrogators you need to direct your response to, but others in that classroom who may not say a word. To others in your workplace who may be listening to your interchange. I get asked all the time, you know, why do you go on TV and debate these pinheads? I mean, do you really think you're ever going to convince them? No. I don't think I'm going to convert the interviewer or my debate partner, but I know there are millions of other people out there listening who need to hear a clear word. Always be mindful, not just of the person you're interacting with, but of those around you. That's what Jesus did. Jesus directed his answers beyond the questioners and talked to the audience as a whole. Secondly, in your answers and in your response, be biblical. Be biblical. Have you noticed in this passage how many times Jesus quoted the Old Testament? The foundation of his argument was always the Bible. You can argue against God's word, but at least when you're using the Bible as your argument, people realize they're arguing with God's words and not yours. Be biblical in your response. And finally, be courageous when you find yourself in the hot seat. I mean, think about Jesus. He knew that within just a few days, these questioners were going to come back at him and end up crucifying him. Nevertheless, he did not flinch in fear. He was courageous. Why? Because unlike the Sadducees, Jesus believed in the resurrection. He believed that one day God would rescue him from the grave. And Jesus understood the only person that really mattered is God himself. You know, as Christians, we need to have the courage that comes from realizing there is nobody on this planet who can do anything to really hurt us. Have you, have you come to realize that? Do you realize when you think about it, there is nobody in this world that can do anything of lasting consequence to you. The only one who holds that power is God himself. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Jesus is saying, live your life for an audience of one. There's only one being in this universe who has the power over your eternal soul, and it's God himself. And living with that realization is the greatest help I know in keeping your cool when you find yourself in the hot seat.